I want to look at a word today that goes off of our scripture uh, that we have. And um, last week, we kind of headed to another direction by the move of the Spirit and uh, didn't get a chance to, to do this. But uh, you still have, uh, how many still have, still have your bulletin with you? This is uh, the, the overheads up. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and look at our, our, our confession in the bulletin. And uh, this the confession is based off of actually Psalm 512. Psalm 512. It says, for you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. Any righteous here? 512. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround him as with a shield. And so this is our confession. You got it in your bulletin. It's in the center there. Scott has kept it before you in bold letters. And uh, let's read it together. Let's say it together. God encompasses me. There you go. Everywhere I go. There you go. You need to read that and understand. I'm telling you what. I'm already seeing unprecedented favor from God. Unprecedented favor. I love favor. As uh, a man that I love to listen to, Jerry Savelle, he, he did a whole thing on favor some years ago. And he says, uh, favor, when you have favor with God, you have preferential treatment. He said, I have favored child status with God. If God's going to do anything good for anybody, it's going to be for me. Because I have favored child status with God. Let me tell you, you ought to make that statement. If God's going to favor anybody today, I'm going to be a part of it. I have preferential favor with my God. Favorite child status, he called it. Favored child status. And that's what it is. You're a favored child of God. Amen. And so, uh, so with this, in verse 11, before 12, there's always 11 before 12 if you haven't noticed. No chapter starts with verse 12. There's always verses before that. But it says, but let all those rejoice, put their trust in you, the psalmist said. Let them ever shout for joy. Say shout for joy. Because you defend them. Let those who love your name be joyful in you. Now, there's three things that he mentioned in this. Trust, trust, rejoice, trust, and shout. These are three things you need to do this year regardless of what happens. You need to trust in God. We talked about that. You need, you need to rejoice. We talked about that. And you know what you're going to have to do? Learn to shout. Hallelujah. Shout. Now, you know, I know some Baptist shouts better than some Pentecostals. I've been to some Baptist churches over shouting Baptists. Anybody ever been around shouting Baptists? I've been some, around some shouting Baptists. You know, Pentecostals used to have a reputation that we like to shout. Now, we had reputations rolling in the floor. That's how they call us holy rollers. <laughs> Swinging from the chandelier. Somebody asked me one day, even since I've been pastor, you guys swing from the chandeliers? I said, you know, not anymore. We got rid of them. We got regular lights now. <laughs> not anymore. No, we used to have them hanging. I said, not anymore. We can't. We, we took them out. We're not swinging from chandeliers anymore. They looked at me like, well, did you used to? But anyway, there's a lot of things that would happen. But the truth is, shouting is not just always running with an emotion. It's something that explodes from within here. You've got to know when to shout. Well, I have nothing to shout about. Well, make something, well, create something to shout about. Create something to shout about. Well, I just lost vision. Well, create one. Create one. See yourself victorious. Create something you can see. Quit seeing defeat. See an opportunity for you to walk with God and be triumphant. Amen. Amen. So in this word shout, this word shout, I want to look at some things here because it's very important. We, we, the, we talked about rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always. How many had an opportunity to rejoice over the last couple of weeks? How many had an opportunity to rejoice and, and you, and you uh, moaned and groaned? Now forget that one. Uh, but anyway, we had an opportunity to rejoice. The Bible said rejoice in the Lord and things are going good. And again, I say rejoice. No, what does it say? Rejoice in the Lord always and again i say rejoice amen 
When, when, how often you rejoice in the Lord? Always. always. But I don't always feel like it. So how does that work? I don't always feel like getting up in the mornings. But you still get up. Angel would make a comment. I know she may have an early client or something. She says, uh, well, we got to get up in the morning. I'm saying we get up in the morning every morning. She mean, she says, I mean, we got to get up early. So you're always going to get up. So you're going to get up. And you're always going to have opportunities to get down. But the Bible says you need to rejoice. So if you can't rejoice, you're going to have a hard time with this last one. Shouting. Because if you don't feel like you have anything to rejoice about, you're sure not going to shout about it. Because some of you are waiting to shout after you see it. No, 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 no. You can't shout once you already see it. Once you already see it, it's easy to shout. Once your need's already met, it's easy to rejoice. But to walk in faith and to believe that God is a God of more than enough before you see it is what's powerful. See, the world says, I'll never believe it until I see it. God says, you'll never see it until you believe it. You got to believe it before you see it, and you got to be able to shout it before it falls. And that is the key to what's going on. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Joshua, chapter 6. Yeah. Amen. Joshua, chapter 6. That is black ribbon number two in my Bible. Joshua chapter six. Joshua chapter six. Now there's some things in here that the psalmist David made a statement here. Let, let me read to you a psalm. You stay at chapter six. It's not for you to turn to. Let me read to you a psalm. Chapter 35 verse 27. Let them shout for joy and be glad. Shout for joy and be glad. Who favor my righteous cause? Now, who favors God's righteous cause? That means that you're going to favor the things that God stands for. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favored my righteous cause. And let them say continually, say continually. Let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Let the people say continuously. Let me tell you, we're going to have to change the way that we speak a little bit. That means we're going to have to learn how to say when we don't feel like saying. Some of you say when you shouldn't say. Some of you say when you, I know I shouldn't have said it, but I did. How did it work for you? So it's, a nature, it's nature of people wanting to say something. Even Peter in the, in the New Testament, when Jesus was at the Mount of Transfiguration, and there, there appeared with Jesus, uh, uh, Elijah and, and Moses. And, and, and uh, so there, there were these people that appeared at this Transfiguration, and uh, it said, uh, and Peter, with really nothing to say, he said. And sometimes that's people. Having nothing really to say, it's important to still say. I know one of our favorite statements, ours, I'll use that lightly. I'm just going to give them a piece of my mind. Most people with that attitude have very little to share. <laughs> Their mind, that is. They have a lot of work, but very little, a lot of words, but very little substance to share in that. So, but the truth is, you've got to know how to say things and walk in this continuously continuously. All right. Uh, chapter six of the book of Joshua. Uh, if you haven't noticed, there's five chapters that precedes this that gives you the history of Joshua, where Joshua became the, the leader. Moses died. Joshua stepped up. They have never been into the promised land. They sent, they sent spies into the promised lands prior to this, 12 spies, 12 of them went and spied out the land, a land that was supposed to be flown with milk and honey. And uh, they knew the results of it. And so they came back and uh, 10 of the 12 spies says, Moses is right. He heard from God. This is a land that flows with milk and honey. It's, uh, that means prosperity. It didn't have rivers of honey and milk, okay, for those you confused. Uh, but uh, it flows with milk and honey, meaning prosperity and, and different things as such. And and so, uh, and these are, the, these are the fruits of it. They brought back grapes. 
While you're in Israel, they'll have these statues where they have two people with a, with a stave between their shoulders with this big cluster of grapes. The grapes were so big. And he said, this is the fruit of it. God is right. Moses heard from God. This is it. But, 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 but. You got to get your butt out of the way <laughs> to do this thing right. But, 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 but. There's giants there. We're not able to do this. I know God said it was there and it was there, but God said it's ours, but I don't think it is. Well, there's no way we can do this. There's no way, there's no way we can do this. There's giants. Listen, there's giants. Everybody, there's giants. Forget about the milk and the honey. There's enough grapes here to go around already. Just come and look at it because that's as close as you're going to get. But two men, two, Joshua and Caleb, part of these 12, stood up and tried to quiet the people. Hey, be quiet here. Listen, God said, say God said. God said it's our land. He gave it to our father Abraham. It, it's already ours. He's not planning on it. Listen, it is ours ours. It's not going to be the future. It is ours right now. We possess it. Matter of fact, we have the title deed to it already. Somebody else is occupying it, but we're going to evict them. Right. Somebody else is occupying what's already ours. In essence, they're squatters and they don't know it. Because God said it's ours. Ten, I'm going. But all of a sudden, God said, all right, we have two. Now, the only two people made it into the promised land of all of those were who? Joshua and Caleb. So now, years later, Moses dies, who sent the spies out, and you got now Joshua the leader, and all of a sudden, they come into this time. Uh, I, I, I love this. Uh, before you get to chapter six, I preached, some, I preached a message on the covenant of God uh, here in uh, chapter four, where he says, I want you to get ready, sanctify yourself today and tomorrow. For the third day, we're going to go over this Jordan, sanctify yourself, clean, cleanse yourself. And then he made a statement. He said, okay, sharpen the knives. He said, because everyone on the eighth day was to be circumcised. That was, the, that was God's command, circumcision. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant. And he says, uh, we're going to circumcise. And I noticed that the people that were born in the wilderness, they were circumcised who came out of Egypt. But, while, but those who were born in Egypt were never circumcised. That means God's people were in the wilderness in a land of just barely enough. God providing for them, say provision. God provided for them a covenant God, kept providing through them, even though they did not circumcise them while they were in the wilderness. So I'm, I'm telling you what, just because God provides your daily substance, just because God gives you food, whatever, it doesn't mean that you're in the place where you need to be with God. Now, I know people say, look, God still blesses them. Well, God still provided for them in the wilderness, but he says, chapter six is coming. You're going to go into a place called Jericho, and I'm going to fight the battle for you, but I'm not going to be the one who fights for you until you get back in the covenant. There are some things that's got to be cut away in your life. You're getting back in covenant. So it's one thing to have God to provide your bread and water and a little quail. It's another thing for God to crush your enemy. It takes covenant. Sharpen the knives. Sharpen the knives. And there they circumcised them. Again, it says again, not because they were circumcised twice, but because those who are on the way were not circumcised. After they healed up, the thing that separated them from that promised land was this Jordan River. And God supernaturally parted the waters. See, when you're saying the promised land, I can't wait to get to the promised land, Pastor. There's, I mean the promised land. And you know, and there's been a lot of songs, and I've said this, and I still get some people going like this. You know, I, I watch, I stand here, and you're facing me so I can see. Uh, but uh, I make statements like, you know, people tried to use Canaan land as a type and shadow of heaven. And uh, we make songs like that. There's songs written about, you know, I'm on my way to Canaan land. And, and, uh, and then there's songs that talks about Canaan being a type of heaven. But the truth is, Canaan land cannot be a type and shadow of heaven. Because 
Jericho was in the land of Canaan. And giants were in the land of Canaan. The enemy was in the land of Canaan. And I promise you, once you go to heaven, there's no more enemy, there's no more giants, and there's no more battles to be fought. Heaven is heaven. Heaven can, Canaan land cannot be heaven. But Canaan land is a place where you'll see the demonstration and the power of God in your life. I like the song, I'm camping, I'm living in Canaan land. I'm on my way to it, I'm in it. I'm in a place where God still fights my battles. He still provides for me. It's still a land of milk and honey. He's still my God. Yes. Amen. 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 So once they get to the promised land, you got a battle. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to get to the promised land. Well, you may have a battle. You may have a battle. There may be giants waiting you there. New levels, bigger devils. Ha <laughs> ha. There may be a battle waiting you there. But that's all right. Because the God that's more than enough is going to be there. Is going to be there. Here we go. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now Jericho was securely shut up because the children of Israel. None went out. None came in. They saw the children of Israel. See, they already heard about how God demonstrated his power. So they shut this city up. This city was meant to never be seized. Never. It was never meant to be overtaken. And actually, Israel had no natural means to overtake them. God's people, zero. The Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hands. It's king and it's mighty men of valor, everyone. It's yours. I've already given it to you. But when you look at the circumstances, did it look like Jericho was in their hands? No. So what if they were moved by what they saw or what they were looking at and didn't believe, thus saith the Lord? See, if you take what you see over what God says, your reality will become what you see and not what you hear. That, that will become your reality. That's why words are so powerful. Even secular psychologists don't say that to kids. You'll warp them. They all agree. Words have impact. We all agree. I've had people tell me, I can't say I'm healed, Pastor, because I'm not healed. Okay, last, last Sunday night, if you were here, we made this very clear. God is the God that heals you in, in the book of Exodus. Isaiah 53. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And by his stripes, I am healed. I will be or am? Am. Then I said, 1 Peter 2, 24, who bore our sins in his body while he hung on the tree that we being dead unto sin may be alive unto God. By whose stripes we were healed. And I said, if you are, then you, if, if I was, you, you, you were healed. If I was, then I am. If he says I was, you were healed, then I am. Amen. So the truth is, God said, even the book of Romans chapter four, talking about Abraham, who even God, say even God, even God. cause those things which be not as though they are. That, uh, Hagans and Copelands didn't do that. God started that. Even God who calls those things which be not as though they are. So God said through the prophet, prophesying about the coming of Christ, by his stripes you are. Peter says you were. Then that means I am. Amen. And I've had people are try to argue, but I'm not saying it until I, until I know it, until I know I am. Oh, come on. And then, then they'll take it to the next level as if you don't have another answer. I am not going to lie. Well, you know, if you're quoting me, and if I'm wrong, then we may be both in a lie. But can God lie? Can God lie? So is it, is it safe to say what God says? I'm not saying I'm healed because I feel like it. I'm saying I'm healed because he says I'm healed. And if he says I'm healed, that satisfies me, therefore I am. Glory to God. 
That's what you got to do. You got to understand. I'm not saying it because I'm, a lie is deception. You're trying to deceive somebody. I don't understand you were the faith people. You're always calling things which be not. And, uh, and uh, I've never seen it work. Well, you know, I've seen some word of faith people even get this confused. The Bible says calling things which be not. But you call them as if it does, as if it exists. Let's talk about that again. We've done it before, but faith comes by hearing, okay? We're going to get back to Jericho here in a second. Call those things which not as though they are. Denying that you have a problem is not faith. Denying you have a problem is not faith. And that's where people got mixed up. I see you have a cold. <coughs> I don't have a cold. <laughs> Denying you have a problem is not faith. Faith is... <laughs> I'm a better actor than I thought. <laughs> Den <laughs> Denying, that was more mouth. Denying you have a problem is not faith. Denying it to stay in your body is faith. In essence, I'm not denying the fact that I have a coat. <laughs> I'm not denying the fact I have it, but I'm denying the right for it to live here. By his stripes, I am healed. I'm denying it's right to exist. Amen? I make this so here, he says, it's, I've given it to you. Verse three, you shall march around the city, all you men of war, and you shall, you shall go all around the city once. This you shall do for six days. So how many times a day for six days? Once. And on the seventh day, Seven times. So you ask people, or off to think, how many times the children of Israel march around Jericho? They'll say seven times. No, 13 times. Once a day for six days, and on seventh day, seven times. It's not, you're not marching around Preble County. This is the city that's fenced in, okay? Now, verse four, the seven priests sh shall bear seven trumpets of ram horns. Before the ark, but the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass. It shall come to pass. It will happen. It shall. It will. Say it shall. It shall. It shall. It shall come to pass. When they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the walls of the city will fall down flat. It didn't say they'll crumble. I, these walls fell flat. They didn't just go up in a heap. They fell flat. That's how they ran over it. They fell flat down. The walls fell flat. You got four corners. It'd be like that wall falling flat, this wall falling flat, that wall falling flat, and you're in. The walls fell flat. The walls will fall flat down and the people shall go up on every man straight before him. So this is the key. Day one, day two. You guys ever watch Veggie Tales? That's exactly what happened. As they marched around, they threw their ices at them, their slurpees at them. Come on. Come on. Keep walking but you can't knock down our wall, keep walking. But it isn't gonna fall. It's, yeah, your brains are very small, keep walking. Now, the truth is, my kids know it. Josh and the big wall, hallelujah. But you gotta understand, they marched around, but you know what was going on the inside? Fear, fear, fear. Instead of us fearing them, they, they're going to fear us. Fear. Fear. And when the sound of the horn was a long blast, God didn't say, start hoping. He just says, shout with a great shout, for it's done. Now, how long did they shout? I don't know. 
It doesn't say how long they shouted. It just said they shouted and the walls fell flat. I would like to think that the more they shouted, the more nervous the enemy got, the more their knees started shaking, the more it ran down their leg. I mean, they were just shouting, nervous. I better stick with veggie tails. And then all of a sudden, a great shout of victory, and the walls fell flat. And they marched in up on them. See, if you're waiting for the walls to fall flat before you shout, you're going to march and march and march and become so weary that you're going to quit marching. You're going to quit marching. God said these walls would fall, fall flat, but I don't see them falling yet. I don't see them falling yet. I don't see them falling yet. Well, they're not going to fall until you shout. Until you shout. You got to shout. You got to shout. You got to shout. You got to shout. Well, what do I say? It's amazing what comes up out of your heart when faith hits it. You've got to shout. You got to shout victory. You got to shout victory. You got to shout victory at it. You got to shout victory. We win. I'm not losing. I'm healed. If I need, if I need my body healed, I'm going to shout. I am healed. Thank you, Lord. Welcome to the church. Service is about over, but I'm glad you woke up on that. <clears throat> I am free. My children are redeemed. I'm going to shout. Shout, it's not the dance. That's a whole other thing. David danced before the Lord, and David knew how to shout before the Lord. Sometimes, as you begin to dance, you will shout, or as you start shouting, it will bring a dance. But shout it out. Shout it out. Something's got to happen in here. There's got to be a belief system in here. If you're going to see the favor of God, you're going to have to trust in God with all your heart. You're going to have to rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. And you're going to have to learn to shout it before you see it. And I believe if you learn to trust, rejoice, and shout, my gosh, the favor of Almighty God is going to be up on you like you have never experienced it in your life. Amen. Every day, that enemy got nervous inside that city. Day two, he got even more nervous. Day three. Then on the seventh day, the seventh day, number one, they're confused. Why they got worshipers leading the pack anyway? Why they got priests? Why, why, why they have this? They only have their warriors up front. Where are their guns? Where are their guns? We have a weapon. We have a weapon on the inside of us. We have a weapon on the inside of us. We have a weapon on the inside of us. It's the word of God, and it comes out with a shout. Amen? There's a weapon in us. And you let that be released, and I promise you, God will open it up for you. Amen? He will fight your battles. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Somebody shout something. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Say shout. 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 Say I'm healed. I'm healed. Say I'm free. I'm, free. I'm delivered. I'm delivered. Glory. Glory to God. Do yes. you, you know what else you can say? Say I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed. from poverty. From sickness, from spiritual death. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What are you going to say? I'm redeemed from poverty, from sickness, and from death. I'm redeemed. You've got to know how to shout it. You've got to know how to shout it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.